Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Justin Leppard with Higher Hertz and today I want to delve deeper into rhythm, rhythm concepts, and especially the elusive concept of groove. Now groove is already kind of a difficult concept to get as a musician and it's made even more complicated on our instruments because in contrast to some other instruments that have very, very definite start times to their notes, even if we're plucking, we have a more definite start time to the note than when we're bowing. When we're bowing, we can be kind of playing a note and then actually land on the note. We can be playing the note kind of before we feel like the note arrives, if that makes sense. Because we don't just do, we can do. So, you know, I'll put my foot down where the beat is, you know. So we intuitively feel notes at certain times based off the intensity, the vibrato that we're using, all of that good stuff. So playing in time is a little bit like playing in tune in that it's very complicated and you think that it could be broken down into a grid, but even that's complicated. So if you were to import a drum groove from a really, really good drummer into a DAW, into a digital audio workstation and zoom in and see, are their beats really landing up exactly in time well, if it's a really good drummer and they've got a really nice pocket, the answer will be no. If it's a really good drummer and they're going for something that is really tightly in time, the answer will probably be yes. It'll be really remarkably in time. But what about this groove thing? What about people who are not playing exactly in time and it's still sounding good? Well, this is why the concept's a little more elusive. So in this video, I wanna start by talking about what groove is. I'm gonna talk a little bit theoretically about it. Then we're gonna relate it specifically to the cello because there's specific problems posed by the bow, especially on cello, and also just the difficulty in actually getting our fingers to the right notes in tune, which can be so distracting. So those are our challenges as cellists when we're trying to play with good time. I also wanna clarify that when I talk about groove, Groove is typically seen as a concept that exists within the world of jazz and blues and rock and things like that, but I'm gonna be using it very broadly to also cover classical ideas about timing. Because the most important idea in classical music about timing is arguably rubato. And in order to have good rubato, which literally means robbed, like robbed time, to take some time and give it back, you have to nonetheless know how to otherwise play basically at the same tempo so that you're not just randomly speeding up and slowing down. The difference between good time and bad time then has a lot to do with intentionality and how organized it is. So let's talk for a second about that drummer and then we're gonna relate it to classical music. So when the drummer's playing out of time, as in they're not metronomic, but they've got a great groove, What's going on is that the various rhythms of the drum hits that they're playing are in a certain relation into, to each other that makes sense. So the metaphor that my jazz teacher uh, or one of them uh, in, in college would use is that groove is like a person walking and different parts of the person are landing on the ground at different times. Your front foot's gonna be in front of your back foot and you might have your keys jingling in this pocket versus your phone in this pocket, but the whole body's moving together. And if a person's got a nice swagger when they're moving, then they've got like a nice groove going on in their moving. And even though different body parts are in different places at different times. So when you listen to an ensemble play together, this is also true. You don't necessarily want everybody in either a band or in a chamber ensemble to necessarily be playing exactly at the right time Sometimes what you like is for things to be a little bit off. So you'll, it's very common for bass parts to be a little more laid back, for perhaps a snare hit to be either exactly in time or maybe a little bit ahead. When you start to be able to think about a beat as having a center point, but then a slightly before and a slightly after, then you can start kind of assigning different roles to what you're playing. So let's use a concrete example, very simple sort of example in cello repertoire, where oftentimes we're playing, you know, bass lines, root notes, thinking string orchestra, we're playing repeated notes, okay? So we're, you know, a those sort of parts. The types of parts where the band director or the orchestra conductor is often probably telling you guys, oh my God, you're rushing, or oh, you're dragging, keep up. And I don't, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, the haphazardness of the time going on around me in student ensembles made it almost impossible to even hear that we were rushing or dragging. So that means it's really important to practice with a metronome. 
And when you practice with a metronome, you're not just trying to land on the beat, you're also trying to understand where on the beat you're going to land. So one thing that people often get wrong about playing with a metronome, like or rather a common rookie mistake, is that you're trying to listen to the metronome, and if you land exactly with the metronome, you wouldn't really hear the metronome. It would blend with your own playing. And so as a result, you become unsure if you were actually playing with the metronome. So it becomes more comfortable to end up playing. Even This is what happens to people even who dutifully set the metronome up. They'll actually be playing out of time. They get used to that because they want to be able to actually hear the metronome. So just turning on a metronome then is not going to be what actually helps you get good time. But there are specific metronome exercises that can help you. Specifically uh, ones where you set the metronome to a very slow tempo, say 40 beats p.m., and try to clap exactly on the next beat. And if you do it correctly, you won't hear the metronome. Like I said, because if it's happening at exactly the same time, your ear will interpret it really as one big sound. This is what happens in ensembles too and why it's so important that for certain parts, people are really, really tightly lined up because the effect is that it's more than just one instrument. That's what happens when you, you, know, you have a part with somebody. So it's really helpful when you're in an ensemble and this relates to you know, a more advanced concept known as score study of knowing who has similar parts to you because that's how you're gonna lock in rhythmically. You can't necessarily play with perfect groove on your own. In fact, sometimes if you were to take the bass or the drums or the cello out of something and listen to it, it doesn't necessarily sound like it's that in time on its own, but it does in context. So other really great exercises with the metronome are to try to set the metronome to things other than the downbeat. So if you watched our video on intonation, this is a related concept to setting the drone to something that's not the tonic. If you set a metronome and then are playing the metronome as though every click is beats two and four of a bar, instead of say one and three, well then you're training yourself to feel that downbeat but still having to line up with the offbeat. Now, when you really start to get a hang of actually internalizing your sense of time, that's when you're going to be able to actually intuit whether you're playing before or behind, ahead of or behind the beat. So one thing that's absolutely critical is that understanding, is that physical understanding. Like people will often talk about feeling rhythm like in your gut. And I don't know if that's a super helpful concept just on its own, but what I can tell you is that if you really try to own the music and move your body to it, you'll train yourself to have an even stronger physical reaction to the music than you might have otherwise felt. And, and raising the intensity level of your emotional and physical reaction to the music is how you're going to improve your knowledge of what's grooving. So I think I've said in another video that if you already are moving to a beat, it's going to help you be able to play in time. So it's not the worst thing in the world. You don't want to like headbang if you're in an orchestra, but it's okay to have some sort of physical motion that's helping you feel the beat. One of the things that was really, really helpful for me is when I started going to orchestra camps uh, in between the summers during my college years. And after going to one camp, it was like the highest level orchestra playing that I had done up until that point in my life. And I could finally count. I went back to my normal orchestra and I could finally count, you know, because there's a, a lot of mixed talent sometimes in a college or high school orchestra, especially. And so a lot of people just aren't playing anything at all that's correct or at least like correctly in time. So it really can be hard to like separate that out. But again, if you come back to trying to do some of those slow metronome exercises and really just like moving along to music so that you can start to feel the groove, well, that's gonna help you in the long run. So we've talked kind of about how groove is this thing where uh, you play when it makes sense, basically. So you're gonna lock in with other players, other parts of what you're playing, and it's always gonna be referenced off of what would be metronomic, even if you make adjustments to that. So a feeling of being ahead or behind, in a classical rubato sense, a feeling of pushing or pulling back the tempo in a way that actually makes sense. And if you watch your video talking about using singing to play better, this can be a great opportunity. That can be a great way to figure out where you actually do want to push and pull so that it's not random, so that you're doing it because you want to heighten the emotion. 
Remember, faster tempos are more exciting than slower tempos, which are more ponderous. So when you pull back the tempo, you're causing people to really like listen in to what you're playing with more detail. When you push the tempo, you're causing people to feel more excitement about what you're playing. So that's the reason why classical music does that, because you can have more excitement, but then you can pay more attention. You can have more excitement than pay more attention. Now, in a, uh, in a setting where there's a more defined sort of consistent beat, you're doing something that's absolutely to a metronome in terms of, you know, the, the tempo's not varying at all, there's still going to be that sensibility about whether you're kind of ahead of or behind the beat. But most importantly is gonna be how you lock in with your own sense of time. The main difference between inexperienced rhythm players and experienced rhythm players is their ability to be consistent with themselves. So you don't wanna be stuck in a place where all of your up bows are a different length than your down bows because then you're always gonna be No. So let's start talking about how we can actually apply these concepts to cello. And let's start by talking about why it can be difficult on cello, the specific problems that are posed. Now, biggest thing in the world is this thing. The bow is such a great musical invention. Almost no other instrument, except for maybe modern day synths, can really achieve the level of vo simultaneous volume and tone control that's possible with a bow. I mean, wind instruments can obviously do a lot. A vo the voice can obviously do an incredible amount as well. The bow, as far as being an invention, really moves beyond the, you know, the voice's natural ability to control tone and phrasing and inflection, and really is like this physical thing that can actually do it. However, you know, we are already pronating our wrist so that the bow can be straight on the string. It can be difficult to actually get the string to speak exactly when we mean it to. And also we have to deal with down bows and up bows, which are basically mechanically different and yet have to sound the same. Finally, there's left hand issues. We get distracted by intonation. We get distracted by whether we're playing the right note. One thing that I realized um, about a year ago or something is that there's already so much to think about when you think about tone and intonation and phrasing that if you then apply rhythm to that, it's, it's almost too late. You can't really do it. So I started to rebuild my concept of playing cello around a more rhythmic concept. And what this means is that you start with your internal sense of the pulse. You don't start playing without that because when you're putting notes out into the air around you, you want those notes to fit into what you can feel and what you, know, you want others to feel when you're playing. Okay, so let's talk technique for a second, and then we're gonna come back to the big picture musicality for cello. Let's talk about how to overcome all of these difficulties. So like I said, one of the things for the left hand is actually just being so confident in the notes that you're able to sort of scale back and start to think purely rhythmically. But you don't have to wait until you already know the notes to do this. One exercise that a lot of classical musicians do when they first get a piece of music, especially when it's difficult, is they sit there and they tap out the rhythms alone to themselves, maybe also uh, doing conducting patterns. So it can be helpful to learn conducting patterns for playing along with music. Uh, I think we've talked about this before, but down is one, uh, to the right or left for you is always gonna be the second to last beat, and up is always going to be the, the last beat of the bar. So if it's in four, you do another one over here, three, four. If it's just three, you just have to worry about those three. If it's two, you just go down and up. And if it's you know five or more, you add other motions, but it's then gonna be that at the end of the bar. Anyways, that's very, very quick lesson on uh, conducting pattern. So pe sitting there and, and doing the conducting pattern, even if it's just in four, but, but uh, vocalizing or tapping out the rhythm is actually a really great starting place for the music because the rhythms can be tricky. And also, you know, you can learn a lot about the music even just from the rhythms alone. So you don't even have to know the key or anything to actually just start musically with the rhythm. Once you've done that and you actually start to learn the notes, well, you can even do left hand alone exercises where you're just putting your fingers down where the notes are, and that can even be out of time so that you're, you're actually able to focus on that independently. That's what practicing is for. It's not for just playing through your pieces and then hoping that you get a little better each time. It's for doing things that you would never be able to do in a performance of a rehearsal, like play the music 
where every single note is the exact same length, just so that you can focus on tone and intonation. Then bring rhythm back into the fold. So that's how I deal with the left hand issues, is to just treat them separately from the rhythm issues themselves. Now let's talk about the bow. When we're talking about the articulation with the bow, it's helpful to think about the ways in which the hand is emulating the mouth and about ways that the mouth is creating articulations. So when you really think about the way that we articulate with our mouth, at least in English, we have sounds like T, where our tongue goes to the, the, the roof of our mouth and then breaks off of it, and we let out a little bit of air as well. So you can think about how T, has a little bit of an analog in the fingers like that. Whereas if you have uh, maybe a similar consonant, D, what makes D different from T? Well, T is a little bit higher and D, you almost have to give a little more force for. So D is more forceful. <clears throat> It can be helpful to try to just go through and try to create meaningful differences between the different consonants. How would you handle V, for example? Just saying vowel. You start with your, your top of the, your teeth on the bottom lip, vowel, and you have to move your mouth. You couldn't say vowel without moving your mouth. It would just be V, <laughs> which sounds very silly. But vowel has this roundness to it that we can also emulate with the bow. Like I did, I moved it kind of more uh, in a circular motion. You can actually do that a little bit. It doesn't have to be super extreme, but you can start to just think this way. It doesn't matter that you're super, you know, meticulous about making every single consonant relate to the bow. I mean, that doesn't necessarily even make sense to begin with for the music, but it is important to understand how to intentionally articulate. And the main way that we articulate is with our fingers because our fingers are basically doing what our tongue is doing, right? And then like just holding the bow itself would be where it moves to different places. Moving the bow is like our air supply. So when we're trying to articulate well and when we're practicing scales, try to uh, really hone in when you're practicing your scales on the rhythm. So especially as you start to get the notes down, really try to be really even with it. And when you hit those new notes, figure out how you can get that articulation to speak right away. So if you're having problems where, you know, and you were just weren't exactly sure how to get that next note, well, then you can do some of the exercises we've talked about where you can take a pause and then get that next note. You want to, in one way or another, take yourself out of the difficulty of connecting those two notes and just think for a second, how do I speak that next note? Then you can start to bridge those two things together. I know that bow technique is like a lot of work and me just saying, oh, work on the articulations is not going to immediately solve the problems, but it really is important to actively practice that even separately from other musical concepts. Now, finally, I want to talk about down versus up bow. And this is just as simple as making sure to remember to always practice up bow. It's similar to how I say always practice the scales going back down. Just as many, if not slightly more ideas musically are going to come in the form of a downward shape. So you don't want to neglect practicing down or you're not going to be able to play those as easily. The same thing applies to rhythm. If you're not practicing playing in time with your scales, it's going to be really hard to then translate that to music that often is scales or single notes repeated. Now, the, the simplest thing that you can do is to just focus on one note, one note or one open string. And like I was doing before with the low A. And right now I'm lifting the bow off the string. I could also practice trying to make it even with my bow staying on the string, which introduces different challenges. And there too, I'm just very concerned with, uh, you know, having these light but um, spring sort of associations with my fingers in order to get the articulation that I'm going for. So then when it comes to actually playing the music, once we have that internal sense of what we're doing, and we know what the notes are supposed to be, and we can work on the bow executing the way that we actually think it sounds, well, then we start to have a good time. Those are the pieces of the puzzle. It's kind of those three steps. I think of a kind of inward outward. It has to start from within you, 
And then it ends with you producing the sound with the bow and then listening and you can feedback with yourself. You can correct sometimes if you got it a little bit messed up. And that's part of experience is not necessarily never messing up, but being able to account for that pretty easily. So anyways, I think that this wraps up this video. I hope that it was a helpful sort of introduction to demystifying timing, especially the relationship between purely metronomic sounds and uh, sounds that have either some sort of pocket groove or some sort of rubato sort of concept to them. For me, it was really hard to go through all of this stuff when I was younger and just hearing about it theoretically. It really helped me to record myself and then be able to know how in tune and in time I was playing or not. But we're gonna delve more deeply into that in another episode. For now, my, once again, my name is Justin Leppard. I'm also known as the Vagabond Cellist and you've been watching me on Higher Hertz. Please subscribe below for more cello lesson videos. We're really excited to bring them all to you. Uh, we really hope your cello journey is going well. Let us know in the comments how things are going and we hope to see you in the next video. Thanks again for watching.